let's just kick off with that January 20th date. Um, not much has happened since November, I understand, Senator, but seriously, uh, at, from a Congress, you were a congressperson now stepping up to the larger part of the, of the Hill. What, what's, what's it been like? I mean, how, how, how would you characterize the transition? What are some ways that you're finding your job being broader, more focused? What's the day like? Sure, well, first of all, it's great to be here, and I do wanna thank uh, Mark for his great service uh, at the Small Business Administration and his work in Maryland for entrepreneurship uh, over the years. And uh, we're, we're missing you over there at uh, the Small Business Administration. Dr. Jalal, thank you and your team uh, for all you do uh, for Maryland and the country and really the world in terms of the innovation that you, you bring to this. And you know, you mentioned January 20th. Um, so I've had sort of two transitions. Uh, one is the transition uh, from the House uh, to the Senate. And, you know, there are some similarities, obviously, and uh, I used to serve as the senior Democrat on the House uh, Budget Committee. I'm now on the Senate Budget Committee and the Senate Appropriations uh, Committee. But there are some obvious differences. One is representing the entire uh, state of Maryland. I used to represent the 8th Congressional District, uh, which is the home to NIH and FDA. Uh, but if you look around our state, uh, both in terms of companies and federal agencies uh, and universities, uh, you find our entire state is really engaged uh, in these very important issues that we're going to talk about today. Second difference um, in the Senate is uh, every individual senator uh, has a little more leverage um, and influence uh, because of the rules of uh, the Senate. Uh, as you saw, there was an erosion of that rule uh, with respect to Supreme Court justices, uh, but uh, the rule with respect to legislation uh, remains, and it's an important part of the Senate rules and tradition because it gives the minority party, whether it's the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, depending on what point in time, uh, the opportunity to have more input, which hopefully drives more bipartisan cooperation uh, over time. So. Moving to the Senate has uh, provided an opportunity not just to represent the whole state of Maryland, but really tr reaching out to many of my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And finally, the other part of the transition is what Mark alluded to, which is we have a very different administration, um, obviously, uh, in the White House. And if you look at their budget, we can talk about it a little bit. Their, their budget has some very serious <laughs> implications uh, for our future, future national investment um, in the biosciences. Let's go there right away. I think okay. that's a great segue, and thank you for that. There are some pretty fascinating, if not shocking, numbers being tossed around. And I know, I know budgets are a very active and living thing, and you'll be voting on them and with your colleagues over time. Um, yesterday, we talked about the NIH budget and other budgets with sort of public-private partnership dollars, where federal dollars, state dollars, together with investment by corporations, have great outcomes. What's your sense of where the budget will go? Uh, these draconian cuts, forgive the adjective, are, are tough for many to see. Do, do you think this will be an iterative process? Do you see funding coming back being as strong? Or where do you, where do you think this conversation is going to take us? So the proposed cuts are, dr draconian is not uh, an overstatement with respect to the uh, cuts in investment in bioscience. And I agree that in order for us to be successful as an ecosystem, uh, we need all hands on deck. Uh, we need the private sector and the business innovation that it brings. Uh, we need our educational community and, and universities. And then you need the federal government. The federal government obviously plays an important role at FDA in terms of uh, overseeing the process of determining the efficacy and safety of, uh, of drugs. But a lot of what the federal government does, of course, is that early stage investment uh, in science. And NIH is the world's premier institution. A lot of us believed before this year that we were underinvested. Uh, in NIH, and if you look at the NIH budget, and you may have discussed this uh, the other day, you've actually seen an erosion in its purchasing power since the early 2000s, about a 20% fall off in actual purchasing power uh, at NIH. Now, in, two years ago, we were successful at uh, getting a bump up to 32 billion, and we've been pressing to expand on that. We passed the Cures Act on a bipartisan basis uh, last December, uh, which both provides more funding for NIH and also some changes to expedite uh, review at places at FDA. So it was a shock, and I think really kind of a bipartisan shock, uh, to see the, the Trump administration budget uh, come down with a almost $6 billion cut uh, to the NIH budget. And 
Dr. Collins, who's done just a terrific job, in my view, uh, at NIH, says the two things that always keep him up at night are, number one, the number of meritorious applications that come into the NIH uh, for new research uh, and the fact that he's not able to fund the, the, the percentage that he used to be able to fund in terms of the meritorious proposal, ones that are deemed to have uh, a real potential. Uh, and second, what signal that sends to all the young scientists uh, who, on the one hand, we say, you know, we want more people in the STEM fields, which we need, but then you have sort of a flashing yellow and almost a red light <laughs> when it comes to that funding, especially a red light if you're talking about a $6 billion cut. So I, I think we are going to overcome this budget proposal, but it is all tied up with not just the NIH funding and the health, you know, HHS funding, but the overall global numbers um, in the budget for defense and non-defense, which gets you in a much larger conversation. But I am hopeful uh, that we're going to be able to uh, at least prevent the cut. And I would, the, the problem is I wish we were in the, ex, the expansion mode rather than the defense, uh, defensive uh, posture here. So one of the assets we talked about yesterday are the educational institutions, both in the state and in this region. What are some ways you see the roles of the University of Maryland system, Johns Hopkins, and other private groups playing in continuing to fund innovation in this sector? Well, it's a huge part of the uh, ecosystem. Here in Maryland and obviously around the country, you have a lot of uh, uh, universities and colleges that are very engaged in this effort. Uh, in Maryland, um, between the University of Maryland and, and Johns Hopkins, for example, we get a large share of the, uh, a, a significant share of that NIH funding. I think Johns Hopkins is the largest recipient in the country uh, of funding from NIH. Uh, look, those institutions, number, number one, we can talk about, we need to get more of our, more students engaged in the STEM uh, from an early age. In fact, Dr. Jalal and I were just talking about how uh, we really need to focus a lot on middle school uh, students um, and, uh, <coughs> and, and girls and women. Um, because if you look at the graduation rates, I think about 60% of our college graduates are women, uh, but under 40%, I think about 36% go into the STEM areas. Uh, so we want to do a lot of that, and I was just out at the, the Maryland Bio uh, mobile van, which goes around Maryland and tries to spark the imagination of young people. So we got to do that. Obviously, universities and the private sector and NIH we have a great opportunity to leverage a lot of talent there uh, through CRADAs, and I, I understand the, you know, the fellow who's in charge of translational research over at NIH uh, was here the other day. But I, I do think it's an area where we in this region um, can do an, a greater job of maximizing uh, the potential. We have these incredible national assets right here uh, in Maryland and in our region. Um, we, we need to better leverage. Uh, those assets and, and the universities can help be part of that ecosystem. That was part of the conversation yesterday. Was what they said we're sort of competing with New York and Boston and Palo Alto, and then you say Maryland, like with our state versus an individual city or a specific specific place with in, in, inside a city like Cambridge. Um, how do you see the region maybe working more together? I mean, the, the Baltimore versus Columbia versus Rockville and and this area versus uh, University of Maryland College Park. Um, do you think they'll stay sort of disparate silos in their own way, or do you see more cooperation co coming forward? Well, one of, one of my goals, um, now that I have the chance to represent the, the whole state, is to work on exactly that um, with local officials as well as state officials. Uh, I know the governor was here yesterday and talked about uh, trying to bring all the sort of resources uh, together, uh, and we need to be working on a, uh, a you know, across you know, local, state, and federal government, and with obviously with the private sector and the university system. So I, I think there's a great desire in the Baltimore area mm -hmm. uh, to you know, be, be become, you know, part of that ecosystem. Um, and you know, you've got the 95 quarter, you got the 270 quarter. So I think there's a lot of potential, and I would just uh, you know invite anyone here who has ideas on how we can better you know. Uh, leverage those Maryland assets and regional uh, as well uh, here. I mean, it's interesting about 
two weeks ago, uh, I was at an event in Baltimore, in, in, the, in the nation's capital in D.C., about regional cooperation in the D.C. area and how D.C. itself in this region could brand itself in a way so it wasn't just seen as a sort of government uh, company town, but what we're talking about here, trying to really uh, create a, uh, uh, a, a brand so that when people think of Maryland um, or this region, that they think, in addition, I mean, in addition to the federal government, you've got all these uh, exciting uh, companies and businesses involved in innovative uh, research and, and the biotech area, and obviously in Maryland, we've got cyber tech uh, as well. Yeah. Well, maybe DMV. That, that's a brand right there. The, the DMV. The DMV. Uh, I'm not sure that's taken hold. But no, actually, I, 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 you, yes, there was a there was like a video trying to really make the DC DMV area into much more of a hip area. So yeah. we'll, you know, this issue came up. I mean, this is a broader issue, obviously, but it came up when the DC area was competing for the Olympics, ah. and they did a lot of surveys about people's perceptions of the District of Columbia. And um, not just nationally, but one of the other issues was internationally. And, um, you know, uh, it, you know the, the politics of what's happening in D.C. Some has a spillover effect in certain terms of perceptions, I'm which shocked. is another issue uh, we're going to have to work on. <clears throat> so we talked about access to capital yesterday. As yes. you know, Congressman Delaney comes from the private sector and, and uh, in, in the capital access world, and I've spent a lot of time in venture capital. It seems like, to your point on brand, there's a lot of funding, there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions activity here, but the, the sizzle and sex appeal of the kind of deals that happen here are not Facebook and, and Snapchat. Um, how do we, or just sort of waxing poetic, how do we continue to promote the fact that, be it cyber, be it uh, ed tech, be it obviously this arena, we are truly kicking ass. Forgive me, it's a technical sure. term, I know, sure. but how, how do we, what are some ways we maybe can work together either with your office and, and with legislators in the private sector to make that, that message more clear? Well, look, we are, if you look at all the numbers, we're doing great, yeah. uh, but we just need to, uh, and in fact, I think this is one of those situations where, you know, if you look at what we're doing on the ground, we're making progress, but it hasn't yet totally caught fire. And that is obviously the focus of this uh, effort to be top three by, by 23. I, I do believe it's partly attracting um, sort of young scientists to this region, and that is partly a, a branding issue. I was talking a little earlier, so my daughter, Anna, our oldest child, uh, works at Instagram. And, you know, they've got a lot of people, obviously, flocking to Silicon Valley in those areas. <clears throat> but biotech um, and cyber are areas that Maryland really uh, is, it's, it's on the map already in terms of the assets. I mean, we, right, we got NIH, we have FDA. We are home to the cyber command. So I, I'm, you know, there are probably a lot of people in this room or elsewhere who can sort of help us on the, the marketing part. Um, and I'm happy to sort of be part of that conversation, but just also in terms of stitching together relationships uh, between universities and NIH and uh, the private sector, I'm, I, I'd like to be a partner with you uh, in that effort. I think the more we do that, the more the rest will, will help to follow. Uh, so but I was walking in here and said, look, I mean, this place looks like a college campus uh, here, and that's, we, we need that, I mean, that, that's kind of the sort of texture uh, to the, the substance of the work that, that goes on. It's no Instagram, but it does look like a college campus. Yeah, I, I know your daughter's out in the, they, they take pictures of food all day. That's the whole <laughs> stick, right? <laughs> that's, that's true. So, and they, so and, and I get constant criticism of my social media from my <laughs> family members. We can work on that. So the phrase public-private partnership is bandied about by all sorts of folks. What are some examples that you or your staff, or maybe as a senator or congressperson, you saw public-private partnerships yield some, some good outcomes, either in this sector or, or, or in others, perhaps in the Chesapeake Bay and stuff like that? Sure. Well, let's start with the sector. And uh, I'm not just saying this, but obviously the work that the Small Business Administration does uh, is an important part of that, the SBIR grants, yeah. um, as well as the Small Business uh, you know, Technology Transfer. Yeah program, which is much smaller, but uh, important. Uh, those, are, those are really important uh, programs in terms of investing in, in startups uh, and you know, smaller, very innovative businesses that then become part of the 
the, the larger uh, picture, often by merging with you know, other companies uh, in the process. And I am pleased that uh, we, we finally, after many years, extended the authorization uh, for the SBI program for another five years. Um, it, there was a lot of conversation about changes we can make, and we should continue those conversations, um, improvements, uh, possibly. But it was really important that we extend that. Uh, second, you know, Maryland many years ago as a state adopted uh, a, a Maryland biotech uh, investment incentive, a tax credit. Um, I actually introduced legislation a number of years ago in the House uh, to have a federal program modeled uh, after that. In fact, it was connected in this way that uh, it was designed to encourage more investment in uh, biotech and innovative startups. And we actually tied it to SBR because you need some kind of ability to say that this company, you know, uh, is at a point where they, you know, they merit this tax credit, uh, investment tax credit. And so that's what we did. Um, there were lots of little pieces to that, but, but if that's something people are interested in exploring, um, we can do that. Jonathan Cohen's here, who is here, was somebody very involved. Many people uh, in this room were. And then, of course, at the state of Maryland, um, they just passed the state expansion of the R&D uh, tax credit to encourage more uh, investment uh, here in Maryland. So I think those are tools to help leverage more you know, private-public partnership. And of course, the CRADAs. Um, are another avenue for, for doing that. So I'm, I'm open to any suggestions uh, people have because as we were saying, I don't, no one, you know, no one sort of sphere can do this on its own. You need all, all three partners, the, the federal investment, the incentives for uh, these partnerships, and then obviously a, a really robust private sector and uh, university. Thanks.